the value of listening really you know objectively and you know in a very unbiased open way and and really hearing where people are coming from and saying well actually if that matters to us how do we how do we how do we get this right Hi, I'm Deirdre Breckenridge. I've spent my entire career helping women to get unstuck, to share their stories, nurture relationships, and to grow their brands. But most of all, to find their voices so they can make a difference. Women Worldwide features the stories of passionate women and the ups and downs of their journeys. With deep insight and advice, let Women Worldwide ignite your passion so you can excel in life. Hi, everyone. Welcome to another episode of Women Worldwide. Thank you for tuning into the show. Now, if you're watching us on YouTube, I'm in a different setting. I'm not in my Women Worldwide office setting. I'm actually in New York City, beautiful New York, unbelievable energy here. Uh, Women Worldwide travels with me because the show must go on, <laughs> as they say. I really appreciate you tuning in, showing up every week, and amplifying the stories of our amazing guests. So let's get to today's topic and special guest. The topic is reputation, the value and importance of reputation. And, you know, when I step back and, and think about reputation today, who isn't? Uh, whether you are the, a global leader of a corporation, whether you're a a leader of a nonprofit, maybe you're in government or you're a politician, or maybe you're an entrepreneur building your business. Reputation matters. Uh, we have so many different communication touch points. Social media can tear down your reputation in a matter of minutes. So I've got a guest who has a lot to say on the topic. Joining me on the show is Sandra McLeod. She is the founder of Echo Research and someone who has spent a good number of her years as an international researcher training leaders on the value and importance of reputation. Uh, Sandra, her company, does market research. And she also, in her experience, really focuses on reputation analysis and evaluation. She's recognized as one of the top 100 in public relations, and she's also served on different boards, um, including the Institute for Public Relations. She's also been on the board of the Arthur W. Page Society and the International Business Leaders Forum Council. So I could go on and on about Sandra, but it's better she shares her journey and all of her insights with you. So Sandra, welcome. It's great to have you on my show. Thank you, Deirdre. Pleasure to be here. I'm sorry you're in New York and I'm in the UK, but we're, we're together, which is great. I know. And, you know, we did meet in New York just a little while back, which is fantastic. And it's, it's so wonderful that we can be doing this show and you're in a completely different part <laughs> of the world. So thank you for that. Sandra, in the introduction, I mentioned, you know, international research and all the work that you're doing around reputation. Maybe you could just share with listeners how you got started on this career path and why the deep interest in, in reputation. Thank you, Deirdre. Um, I suppose as with a lot of people who eventually find their career, maybe the first job isn't where they eventually end up. That was very much my story. I started with actually in communications as head of communications for a management consultancy uh, in London, PA Management Consultants doing phenomenally well in the 1980s. And as head of communications, they always wanted to be in the front cover of the Financial Times, the Wall Street Journal, The Economist. And I remember just saying to them, why, why do we want this profile? Are we really thinking about our narrative and our content and so on? And they said, no, 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 just keep on giving us profile. Uh, we're doing so well. And you know, we, we did a lot of interesting things, opened up a lot of new sectors, opened up a lot of uh, new approaches to managing business, such as in those days, total quality management and things like that. It was brand new in the, in the 1980s. So we were doing things like that, but never standing back and saying, what, how is this landing? What impact is this having on our, our stakeholders, our community? And I remember saying to the partners, and they were all men, <laughs> Yeah, I was, I was the little girl in PR to a certain extent. Um, and I sometimes sort of felt they suffered me. And as long as I kept on bringing in, you know, great coverage in The Economist, The Wall Street Journal, and The FT, they, you know, they were happy. And I said, 
could I possibly talk to our clients and our former clients and some of our prospects and see what they think about us and the sector and you know our competitors and our offerings? And they sort of almost patted me on the head and said, "Yep, off, off you go." <laughs> we were doing well. We were doing well, and it was it was it was in the eighties, so budgets weren't issues. You know, it wasn't a burning platform. It was just saying, "Well, you obviously want to do this. We believe in you. You're doing well. Off you do it." So I did um, with a really great team of researchers, and we spoke to our clients and former clients and prospects. And it was about McKinsey and PA and KPMG and Deloitte and all, all the majors, all the majors in the industry. And I came back, and the first slide I shared with them was a quote from one of our current clients saying, "I'm leaving PA to join or to, to work with a another um, because PA doesn't do this particular service that is really important to me." And I put that up. <laughs> That one slide up and the whole boardroom, I mean, it was, it was about 30 male, very senior, very bright male partners all went quiet and they sort of looked at each other and I said, right, can we now talk about our narrative? Can we now talk about the things that matter to, to our community? Because we do these things in spades, but we're simply not talking about it. And that was a really aha moment for me to say, gosh, this is really powerful. That's a wake up call. Yeah, it, I can only imagine the faces of all of those and, professionals. Yeah, and you know, they thought, gosh, one, this is this hurts. Two, it isn't fair. Um, three, we're better than this. Four, how do we fix it? And as I said, from my side, it was, gosh, the, the value of listening. The value of listening really, you know, objectively, un, you know, in a very unbiased, open way. And, and really hearing where people are coming from and saying, well, actually, if that matters to us, how do we, how do we, how do we get this right? How do we get this right? So that's where I moved from being um, you know, a senior leader in communications to someone on the research side to say, well, how do we help others? Maybe before they lose their major clients, maybe before they fall off the cliff with a crisis that's been simmering for some time, but they've chosen not to address it. You know, maybe before some of these things to say, how can we anticipate what's around the corner? And actually with good listening, right. which is digital listening, right the way through to interviews. I mean, there's all sorts of ways that one, one can do this to say, well, actually, how do we really help organizations be better, be better? And a lot of times organizations are doing amazing things, but they don't talk about it or they don't right. talk about it in the right way. So, yeah. So I fell in love with research. And when you fall in love with something, it's, it's easy to work in it. So falling in love with research because... Um, it kind of implies that you have to put your math brain hat on. So do you feel that you um, had a lot of schooling in the area of math? I know that on the show we talk about STEM careers. Is that something that you focused on as a part of your learning and that you were good at? Maybe speak to what you need to know on the research side. Yeah, no, it was it was helpful. I did my, um, funnily enough, I did my communications degree in Canada at a women's university called oh. University in uh, in Halifax. And I'd never been to Halifax before, never been to a women's university. But we were the guinea pig year that went through there, what was then the, the PR program, the bachelor PR program. And they threw everything at us. So we got law, we got statistics, we got economics, we got accounting, we got marketing, we got radio interviews, we got, we, we, we got everything, journalism, so on. Everything was thrown into this pot, which I loved because you're getting it from all directions. You're getting the, you know, the art of the storytelling and, and how to talk and how to engage right the way through to how do you actually use and harness evidence to support your arguments and, and do it in a way that's very sound. So, you know, the legal, the legal studies that we did, I loved as well because of the logic of that and actually the, the rigor that that implies. And if you pull that all together, it's, it was actually, it was a wonderful four-year program. I loved my studies um, and loved to be able to apply it. But I found coming onto the research side, just harnessed all that because I did enjoy it. I mean, I was, I was, was a little bit of a geek. I, I enjoyed statistics. I loved economics and I loved <laughs> Kind of things um, in addition to the language and the you know the history and the writing and the English and everything that goes with that so it, it brings it all together yeah Fantastic. It's useful to have a sense of numbers mm -hmm. you don't have to be a mathematical genius I know a lot of people hate statistics and part of what we try and do is demystify um, if you like the, 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 the fear of numbers and actually saying well what story is this telling us 
not has gone up by 0.5%, but actually, does this matter? Will this, will this impact your organization in some shape or form? Let's, let's unpick that. So really, it's the narrative behind the numbers. Understand what the numbers are, how you get there. But really, the, the strength of really the research side is, is the narrative and what does this mean? Absolutely. So, Sandra, you know, back in the 80s when all of these male executives were looking at you like, <laughs> really, I can't believe this. Is it that, I mean, I'm sure today more uh, leaders understand that you want to be doing this research. Are you finding that companies are coming to you to listen and to tune in uh, before they're on the edge of crisis or before? The crisis has actually occurred. Yeah, yeah I think I've, I've had um, an arc of about 30 years in this, in this business and thinking about where I started and where we are now and the conversations I'm having, the conversations are different. They are m much more senior. It really is leaders now connected with it. Whereas beforehand it was, well, you know, is our PR working? That may be a material, but actually I'm more concerned about my advertising than my PR. Now it's more a question of saying, gosh, what am I missing? How can I make sure that on the one hand, I pass the baton on in better shape than when I came into this organization? And there is a, there is a sense of that, you know, among the best leaders that they want sure. to do the best job and leave it in a better condition, better shape. Um, so you've got that on the one hand, right the way through to how do I anticipate what's around the corner? There's so much transformation, so much change, things happening at such a pace that you know your professional judgment and your instinct of what was right five ten years ago or even five years ago is now no longer valid because it's moving so quickly so now we're getting we are genuinely getting bored saying help us understand one how others see us how we're seen internally culture is hugely important and everyone knows you know culture eats breakfast for, you know eat strategy for breakfast all the time so it, it's it's it, there's that appetite whereas even 10 years ago you know, things like culture, things like uh, stakeholders, things like even listening wasn't necessarily high on the agenda, but it is now. Right. Yes. All priorities now. Let's talk a little bit about social media. So maybe just give your thoughts on how social media plays into reputation management and what these brands are struggling with. Yeah. Some brands. Yeah. Yeah. I, you know, social media is... Um, I like, I like to call it the yin and the yang of social media. On the, on the one hand, there's this extraordinary facility. You know, here you are in New York. I'm in the UK. I'm, I'm sitting in front of you. You know, we're having our cup of tea together. It's wonderful. Um, you know, that is the value of social media. And hopefully we're connecting to new friends out in the world. So there's a wonderful power there that we never had before. Um, and, and using social media, particularly in our world, for listening, and for it's seeing where are the conversations going, where are the concerns going, what's happening to plastics, what's happening to concerns around chemicals, what's happening to all these things, you know, where who's behind it, what are some of the solutions? That's really powerful, and it becomes accessible and not horribly expensive. You know, you and I couldn't be doing this 20 years ago. Exactly. You know, yes, you're right. We would have we would have rented a studio. We could have done something, and it but it would have been expensive. We could have done it. Mm -hmm. it and thousands of dollars later, it would have been done. Absolutely, and time to edit and all that. You know, so you've got all that going on. So there is this wonderful thing about social media that's connecting. And then there's the downside that is the very scary dark side of social media, which is, you know, all, all the fake news, the misinformation, the artificial worlds that are created, the false expectations that I set, you know, that I think hurt individuals and hurt organizations in, in, in different ways. So you have, as I say, this, this, it really is the yin and the yang. You've got the light and the dark right. uh, and, and understanding how to approach it. And I think um, there was a lovely uh, expression I heard a little while ago about how most leaders um, of a certain age are terrified of social media and they don't know why they need to get close to it, why they need to be involved, how they, you know, all, all that. So you, you, you can hear that coming. And then someone who joins their organization if they're under the age of 22, is immediately put into the digital department. <laughs> they get that space. Yeah, they get it. They're sort of natives. You have to bridge I, that gap. <laughs> yeah. what, what someone said, which was, I think, so wise, was, you know, all the 50 and 60-year-olds, you know, particularly those who've been hugely experienced in customer service and, and good listening to customers and clients and so on, they're the ones who need to be put onto the social media side because they're so much more genuine and knowledgeable um, 
and they know how to respond to, you know, to sometimes some very difficult situations. Right. Which a 22 year old, in all fairness, probably will struggle with, has the know how technologically, but doesn't necessarily have the bandwidth that a 50 or 60 year old will. Right. And you can train on those tools, but it, it just is a really interesting thing to say, we kind of need to rethink how we approach. And also, when do we engage? When do we not engage? What is appropriate? And what is the right, right tone, you know, as well, I think is very important. Exactly. I, I know, I understand what you mean about, there are so many young professionals who are so savvy with the technology and you have other folks in the corporation or the business that have the business acumen <laughs> and it really they have a strength with customer service and they understand the how the business runs and the the value of reputation if you were to bring that together yeah. it's so much stronger um, and and we're working on it I mean there's definitely work to be done but I do think that when it comes to social media, the ability for, for leaders, and you talked about the 50 or the 60 year, year olds, to, if they are not on social media themselves, to at least empower others to be on social media because building your community, the relationships you forge, that's the difference between community coming to stand up for you and community when you're in a crisis or you're facing reputational issues that might be listening to some of the misinformation or the fake news. So building those relationships, um, and I'm still all for in-person relationships, online relationships, but social media relationships too in those communities. And, and as, as you say, just having that the right voice and having mm -hmm. the of you know, of, of, of the associates across the organization, so powerful, so powerful. And I think organizations are starting to get it. They're still a little uncomfortable with it. And when, when are you speaking up for you? When are you speaking up for the organization? And when do those two blur? Right. We've seen a number of particularly high, um, well, I suppose the, the, the sporting incidents where the, the, the sports star has said something that hasn't been well received and do they get sacked, don't they get sacked? You then say, well, if we're empowering people, give them guidance. Guidelines. Say, Guidelines. Hey, there's, yes. There's, there's you on the you know the, the official Twitter feed or LinkedIn page or whatever, and then there's the you that's a private you, which is separate. And and to a certain extent, if you have very strong beliefs, that's fine on your private side, but not in the corporate setting. And how to manage that responsibly? You know, it is not a question of muzzling, but it's a question of being responsible about it. And and I think respectful. Oh, definitely. Really, really good points. I wanted to, um, you mentioned within the organization, which made me think of uh, building your own sort of credibility and being a leader. And I thought maybe in the spirit of women worldwide and, and women, maybe we could just touch on uh, how women can build their reputation among their peers or as a leader in a company. It's really interesting, and, I, and I'll, I'll answer that with, a, with an anecdote. I remember um, I'm part of uh, the McKinsey Women as Leaders Forum uh, in London, and I remember we had a session where they said, name your most powerful female mentor, and they asked this of, of the leaders in front of them. And we all had mentors. We all had mentors growing up. When you then say that you only, we only want you to have a female mentor, that made people stop and it challenged them to say, gosh, who, who, in, you know, who helped me as another woman? And a lot of people struggled with that. Um, and those of us who were blessed to have really strong other women leaders help us along the way, we were then ident asked to identify the traits that went with it. And they weren't shouty women. They weren't loud women. They weren't uh, overly assertive or, or aggressive women. They all had their own personality, their own approach. And I know, I know certainly the woman I was thinking of, extremely, extremely softly spoken, but so powerful and so warm. You know, and I think the whole thing about leadership is, is ultimately really being yourself, believe in what you believe in. And always, you know, and I'll say this to my children, you know, you're stronger than you think you are. And I think that's true for all of us. There, there's always that little voice going, ah, should I be doing this? Should I be seeing this? And actually, you know, if you believe in yourself, we, I think we all have wings. And I think it's giving ourselves that wings. We don't have to be shouty. We don't have to be men. Um, and we can be very strong. Yeah. Oh, that's so true. I mean, be yourself is, believing in yourself is so powerful. I remember being a young professional 
and going to a networking event. And a woman um, was speaking about how we should enter the boardroom and kind of be like men and never, never take anything that looks like a purse into the boardroom because they will look at you differently. And even back then I thought to myself, if they're not going to like me, is it because of my purse? <laughs> you know, like I just have to be myself, but it was sort of challenging um, because I was, you know, it was a, a different time and a different way of thinking. But now I really feel like you can be yourself. If you can be soft-spoken, but you can be strong, you can balance. And that's the best way to be, not like anybody else, but just what's inside of you. So I agree with you. Yeah, and dare to be different. You know, I think too much blending in is, then you don't stand out either. And I think right. you need to be different. Bring that orange handbag, bring that, <laughs> yes, bring it on. You know? Right, it's bring just, it on. <laughs> I might just go get an orange handbag. <laughs> oh, Sandra, I'm going to ask you to hold your thoughts just for a moment. We're going to shift our focus to our sponsor of today's episode, which is Rutledge Publishing. And Rutledge Publishing is one of the leading academic publishers in the world, publishing textbooks and academic journals. And they also happen to be the publisher of my book, my latest book, Answers for Modern Communicators. And I wish I had a copy of the book to show, but I left that in my other office because uh, I usually show the book. But Sandra, I thought it would be uh, a lot of fun if you could answer a question from my book because I answer over... 150 questions that people around the world have been asking me over the years about reputation, building relationships, socializing your brand, mentoring. So I, I picked a question out of the reputation chapter for you. Are you ready? Come go. Yes. Okay. So your question, let me get it. Hang on. <laughs> your question 122, which is, what does it mean to be true to your brand? Yeah, that's a lovely question. Really nice question. And um, I wish I had your book in front of me because I could say, well, compared to your answer, <laughs> certainly in, in the world that I'm in, um, a lot of the discussions we have is around purpose, yeah, and how to think about the purpose of the organization. And when we're hearing a lot of calls for greater CEO activism, greater, you know, involvement in the issues of the day and so on, I'll always say, well, look at this through the prism of your purpose. Does it make sense? The prism is a lens. Does, does this make sense for you to come through in that way? And I think a lot of things around uh, reputation is the coherence, how consistent, how coherent are you, you know, across all the pieces. There's no good saying our products over here are green, but our products over here pollute. That's just, that doesn't help. And, 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 and eventually you will be found to, you know, to the, that dissonance will, 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 will make you unstuck. And I think it's that issue of the coherence and the consistency um, in, in the relation to your purpose is actually how brands stay true to themselves. And it's hard. It sounds really easy, but it's hard. It says we take the decision, therefore, not to do certain things or to stop doing certain things, or perhaps not engage on that particular issue because it doesn't make sense given this prism that we are committed to. Excellent answer. Thank you for answering that question. How did you answer it? Um, I said, be true to yourself is about being yourself. So I answered it from the professional executive side. And I think I even um, shared a story about a, a previous role that I played where the company really wanted me to look a certain way and dress a certain way and put on certain makeup and it didn't feel like me. And it was almost that devil wears Prada moment <laughs> where I, if you saw the movie with Anne Hathaway, I threw my phone into the fountain and said, that's it. You know, I left that role and I just found myself and was true to my own purpose and, and who I really was. And it did, it was about at every touch point, be who you are and it's consistency and how you show up and the relationships that you build. So thank you for asking. <laughs> and thank you to Rutledge for sponsoring this episode of Women Worldwide. Okay, Sandra, let's dive back in to our discussion. I would love to chat a little bit about you as an entrepreneur. 
um, because, you know, being, working with corporations, playing a role, and then building your own company is very different. So what do you think it takes to be an entrepreneur today? I think belief, belief, belief in yourself, belief in what you're doing, belief that it'll make a difference. Yeah, I think that you've got to start with that. It can't just be, I'm going to guess, or I want to part play at this. Because it's a long run, you know, you go through, you know, a couple of years, no salary, not quite sure how your business plan is going to, you know, come through. And, you know, when the bank says, oh, do me another business plan, I'm going, well, actually, I just want to do the business at this point rather than the other <laughs> Um, but that belief carries you through and it needs to because there, 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 there are times when it's tough. But one of the most important things, and, and this is where I've personally been blessed, is, you know, I'm, I'm in a partnership with my husband and he stood behind, you know, beside me and behind me to say, right, I was with him as his career took off. He was going to be behind me as mine did. And he That's never great. did. Doing. And, and I think when you have... You know, being blessed in that, in, in someone else believing in you and knowing that there was a safety net. It doesn't feel like I was being particularly brave. It just felt I was being really blessed. And I, and I was, and I recognize that. Um, but, you know, you need that belief to carry you through those dog days and those blue days and those, do I have enough money to buy the next little lot of paper bidets and I'm still sticking stamps on envelopes. But it's, you know, when you believe in it, it's, it's not the money that you get paid. It's, it's, it's none of that. It's actually saying, I know this is good and I know this helps oh, and that, that carries everything. Yeah. yeah. So yeah. I think with, with entrepreneurs, I think it's having, having that belief and having that rigor and also to a certain extent, having the eyes open that it will, there will be difficult times and, and being able to manage your expectation and caution your, I suppose your anticipation that why hasn't it turned around and I'm in month two. Well, it could be like that for two years before it starts to turn around. And, you know, are you prepared for that, that, that long haul? Right. Patience and perseverance. Definitely. I mean, for entrepreneurs, um, I know myself, it's always, I wish that was yesterday, but um, just the passion keeps me going forward and also feeling like I'm making a difference. Yeah. You know, when you believe in yourself and you believe in what you're doing, you see things changing around you and that, that feels so good, but there are hard times and, you know, a, do you also surround yourself with a certain type of professional or people? I know you mentioned your husband who is a true supporter and it, it's wonderful that you stand by each other through your career, but what about um, your network or inner circle? How do, how do you build that? I, <laughs> anyone who is a, um, a mom will probably say their friends eventually become friends from their other children's friends. <laughs> My daughter turning around saying, mommy, just get your own friends, won't you? Because <laughs> my network, my close friends actually are the parents of, you know, of my children's friends. But when I look at them, they all are entrepreneurs, all of them. Interesting. Yeah. Yeah. It's just like, oh gosh, n none of them. I think one has what I would call a proper nine to five job in the city, but all the others are self-starters, run their own businesses, do amazing things. And it's just, it's just how that that's come through. So it's not. By design but it's it's how how that happens um but yeah that's Definitely. great i mean the conversations I'm, I'm sure that there's conversations around family and and children as as they grow but having people who are entrepreneurs and understand about building a business that's so helpful because insights are just naturally shared and advice and it, it's good to have that and I remember taking a phone call down and I was skiing with friends and they was just down a very difficult slope and I had to take a call and they fully understood. They said, yes, you need to make this call. We'll be fine. We'll wait for you at the bottom. Anyone else would have been screaming at me. Saying, <laughs> no, get off the phone. <laughs> throw the phone away. And they turned it, but they all get it. And they all think, yeah, there are moments you have to do things like that. And it was fine. And I was thinking, That's gosh, right. anyone else would have divorced me as a friend. I think. <laughs> I just remember this. Is, uh, you just brought back a memory. I was on the ferry going over to Block Island. So we always stayed at my parents' home in Rhode Island and we take the ferry over to Block Island and go bike riding the entire family. And I had a corporate client and they had a reputation issue. Something was going on and I was on the ferry on the phone. It was loud. I couldn't hear. There was family around me. And I remember 
my family was angry <laughs> at me and they wanted me to get off the phone. No entrepreneurs in, in my family, or at least then at the time there weren't. So I can relate to that. Having people around you who understand that helps. <laughs> It does help. It gives you a little bit more bandwidth again. Yeah. <laughs> yes, definitely. So what is something um, that you, so when you look back over your career and how you've grown and now as an entrepreneur and you founded Echo Research, is there anything that stands out um, where you say to yourself, wow, I never knew I could do that <laughs> or... Oh, I'm so glad that I did this. What what really stands out to you during your your journey that surprises you? In in hindsight, it looks like what I've done makes a lot of sense. <laughs> At the time, it was like you know how does how does all this come together? I'm leaving one thing to do something else, and I'm not staying with it, and I'm changing, and it didn't seem to make sense. But actually, when I look back on it, it's all been great experience and great learnings and i think it's just you know even if they're difficult times it's taking that silver cloud or you've got that silver lining yeah around mm -hmm. and making the most of it and seeing how this connects and if i look back on it and thinking i took things from every experience i went to and i'm better for those things yeah and i think that's important too is to say you know especially for those who are in things that aren't quite right Either there are reasons for that, and as they come through, they'll look back and say, well, at least I've learned this. Either I don't want to put up with something like that again, and I'm going to change that, or I'm going to change the way I want to work, or the people I want to work with. But coming out with a learning that you can then apply, I think it's huge. So, as I say, my, my, my career was certainly wasn't planned. I don't know, some people plan their career, and I'm, I'm full of admiration for that. I think my career happened to me, but I happen to be passionate about what I do, which is, which is very fortunate. But as I say, it's just taking the learnings at every step of the way. That's great. Yeah, it's always what you do from the experience, um, good, bad, or indifferent. Do you have any, um, is there anything that was one of those moments where you, you were like, aha, this is the big you know, uh, epiphany, or even if it was a learning moment that felt really uncomfortable that made you move forward that you want to share? Does anything stand out there that might help listeners? Because they face challenges all of the time. We all do. Yeah, I, it's, I mean, there's all sorts of little things that you then say, can you embrace it and have it become part of you? And I have a friend, um, he used to be one of the top directors of HP, and I remember he listening to him when he would talk to his teams and I would be bringing in sort of how, how HP was seen. So I was always, I was always had the interesting things in terms of, if you like, the eye candy and the perspectives and this, that and the other. But he would always start off his, his meetings by saying, you know, make a promise, keep a promise. Okay. And this issue of, of what you say to people and what you commit to is so important. And I've taken that on very strongly, particularly not obviously with clients because you wouldn't be in business if you didn't make your, you know, deliver on your commitments. But I think particularly internally with your colleagues and your associates, if you make a promise to them, yeah, and you're going to stand by them and you're going to support them and mentor them and put them forward for this, that and the other, or, you know, reward them, however, whatever that promise may be, you have to keep that promise. And particularly internally and I've really learned that because I've watched other situations with other people when they've made promises lightly to people and they went yeah that was then this is now so we're tearing all that up oh. and that lot of trust and something some some of that glue just mm -hmm. break inside when that happens and I think that to me has been you know it's such a simple thing and we all do it imperfectly yeah yeah but Little thing of you know you make a promise you you know you, you keep a promise you deliver on that promise um, is so important and I think particularly internally and particularly with with young people because it's so easy to disillusion them you know and say oh yes I'll do the you know your performance review tomorrow and tomorrow comes saying well actually I'm busy we'll do it in six weeks time you've destroyed that poor little person in the meantime and you know right. yeah you, you you can see that working its way through so I think this issue of of really um, committing to your words 
I think, as a human being, I think is really important. That's a great point. I often even take that internally to myself. If you make a promise to yourself that you're going to do something, you should follow through. Because however, whatever you're doing, whatever discipline you have, however you conduct yourself, that is then an extension outward to how you treat others. Like they, they say, if you don't love yourself, how do you love others? I kind of feel the same way about the promise. If you're not true to yourself, how do you be true to others? So it's very interesting. Um, especially, um, I do find that with young professionals, how much they look up to their role models and their mentors and how meaningful, words can be so meaningful, and actions more powerful. So we really have to stick with our promises there. Yeah. Definitely. Yeah. So Sandra, what, um, I guess, you know, with everything that you're doing and all the experiences that you've had and, and the ways that you're training others, how are you keeping up to date with your research, your knowledge, staying up with the trends? I know there's a lot of information out there, but are there any particular resources that you rely on? Um, I am part of something called the Page Society, um, and it's for the CCOs, the Chief uh, Communications Officers, from around the world. And they do an awful lot about sharing experiences, sharing best practice, developing new thought leadership and so on. And I've been on the board for seven years and I have learned so much with some of the top sort of fortune CCOs of particularly the US, but elsewhere as well. Um, and being part of that community and isn't, it isn't just receiving the information, but being active, you know, right. like if you're going to be part of something, be part of it. So again, I've had, and, 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 and all these organizations are hungry for volunteers and hungry for support and so on. So really being active with PAGE. I'm also active with something called the International um, Integrated Reporting Council, which is about how all the intangibles come together to say, well, actually, this is where the real value of the organization happens to be, and how do we report on a way that is meaningful for the financial markets as well and the other stakeholders. And listening to those conversations, and it's particularly listening to the language that leaders use to say, well, actually, how can, how can you articulate something that actually is probably what they're already thinking, but you're using their words. <laughs> so again, being part of that kind of discussion, part of those fora, I find in my world is very important is actually where, where are the leaders of communications going? Where are the, the, the best minds and thinkers around measuring intangibles? Where are they going? What are their discussions? Um, so being active in those kind of fora, um, right the way through to reading as much as I can. And as I say, you know, the McKinsey quarterlies, they're not quarterly, they're sort of almost twice, twice a day. I sort of get all these misses. <laughs> the latest research from, and, they, and there are things that don't really touch me. And there are other things you think, well, actually, there's some very useful things there that one can apply. So I do read a lot. I read The Economist, I read The Wall Street Journal, I look at Fortune, I look at Fortune. I mean, I'm, I, I read a lot in this area. Partly to hear where other people are coming from, but also the language that they use so that we can help resonate with that as well. Yeah. Excellent. On the note of um, associations and societies, do you recommend that younger professionals get involved with their industry associations and that they look to these groups for, for learning and go to the conferences and network? I, yes, and, and I, I, would, I would qualify that because I think there are a lot of different types of bodies and organizations out there. And I think right. the good quality ones, absolutely. What a great opportunity to learn, but be involved, you know, put your hand up. I think that's, that's, that's the learning on that one is volunteer. Um, right. And then you end up with an extraordinary community of friends and colleagues and associates that you never would have had if you hadn't put yourself out and actually really wanted to do something. Right, and role models too. It's a Absolutely. great way to find a, a role model and connect. Um, how, do you, how do you manage <laughs> all of this? So you're up to date in your career, you're uh, doing your international research, you're training leaders. Um, how are you kind of managing time? I know, I don't think I have a problem. I have a problem on building me time, and I think yes. a lot of 
a lot of people would say that. A lot of parents would say that. You know, between you know, being a parent, running a company, doing a lot of other things as well, is then saying, "I haven't gone to the gym for the last two weeks." You know, that she's saying, "How do you?" And I know that's wrong, and that goes back to make a promise, keep a promise. Is how do you how do you build in that you time as opposed to this is this is really I need to do it for other people time. Yeah, and that yeah. that uh, hands up. I don't do that well on that side. But. <laughs> I'm working on it. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm jealous of that um, 103-year-old. I think she was a Georgian national who ran the marathon. Oh, my goodness. She, this through. she was 103, and she's my new role model. I love her. They said she's unbelievable. Run, walked the last, the last bit, but I thought, my God, she's out there. She's running Compass Mentis. I'm, yep, my <sighs> role model. So that's what um, I'm, my next target. That's my next target. Oh, I'm in awe. That, that is truly amazing. Well, Sandra, we're actually at the part of the show where you get to offer advice to women worldwide listeners. So what do you want to tell all of the listeners and, and viewers out there about reputation management and staying true to their brand? Well, uh, yeah. Well, there's so much, uh, I think, in that we're still, they we're still unpicking, actually, what drives behavior. And we know that ultimately reputation and trust are the things that keep us talking, that keep us loyal, that make us buy, support, endorse, all sorts of things. So this is an area that is actually going to get more and more important because we've got a very noisy world out there uh -huh. and getting cut through things that people can trust and believe in. Noisy misinformation, disinformation world is just getting more important. So I think this is this is this is a, a big thing at a you know, corporate environment, organizational environment, because it's true for governments and departments as much as it is for organizations. When you come down to the individual, at the individual level, you know, that is a reputation to be managed as well. How do, you know, having people manage their own, their own reputation, their own brand, being true to themselves, things that matter to them, making sure they go to the gym more than once a month, if that's important to them, and actually delivering on that, but just building in that, that the things that matter to them, but also the things that are consistent with their own beliefs and their own values. Yeah. Excellent. Thank you for all of your advice. Last question, super easy. Where can people find out more about you and Echo Research? Oh, thank you, Deirdre. Um, well, literally echoresearch.com. Um, <laughs> It's, it's all there and, and there are a lot of case studies I, I, I believe in a lot of sharing and if there are things that people are interested in and it's not up there we've got 30 years of experience and there's probably <laughs> we haven't done or an issue we haven't tackled so very happy to share um, and and be part of your community and thank you Deirdre this has been an absolute pleasure oh thank you it was so great to chat with you really appreciate you coming on the show sharing your advice and, and all of your insights i hope everybody out there uh, walks away understanding the value and importance of reputation and the work that you're doing so thank you sandra and thank you to all of you for tuning into women worldwide we just want to say keep sharing the feedback uh, we love hearing from you you're tweeting us, you're, you're posting on Facebook. Uh, please also rate us on iTunes if you get a moment and subscribe to the YouTube channel. You can also go to womenworldwideshow.com and sign up for updates. Uh, we love hearing, so keep the feedback coming. Okay, everybody, until our next episode, stay focused, energized, and feeling empowered. Thank you. Thanks, Deirdre. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Thanks.